Hello everyone, welcome back to another video on my book channel. Once more, I'm joined by Mark Zimmerman to complete the four video series that we're doing on Stormlight Archives. If you guys uh, missed any of the ones that we did previously, we did uh, recaps and reviews for the last three books. And now, that Rhythm complete of War... For three, weeks, for three years, I guess. What? It's only complete for three years. Well, yes, but who knows if either of us are still creating content in three years. Uh, could be dead. Hopefully this channel is still doing so. Anyway, uh, Rhythm of War is now out, and we've read it, and we interviewed Brandon Sanderson about it. If you missed that, it's on this channel as well. Uh, Mark has a more fancy copy, but mine ha I have a more exclusive copy. But you have this copy, though, too. It's just up there. Yeah, it's, it's up there still. Thank you. Shout out to uh, Brandon Sanderson and his team for sending Mark, myself, and DJ Wheat uh, advanced copies that are signed. Uh, very cool. Anyway, so let's get into it. Uh, let's start with the the recap. By the way, I'm I'm not going to pause the video halfway through. I'm just going to say there's an Audible link in the description below if you guys want to help uh, me out and sign up for Audible. That, that'd be swell. Mark. Alrighty. So let's start with the recap um, in case you're watching this in the future. Um, you know, and the book has not just come out. You just finished reading it. This will be a it's good Three years from now, oh. you're watching this video to try to recap. Yeah. Uh, so part one mostly kind of starts with this Hearthstone battle. Uh, they're returning to bring a lot of Kaladin's family and the residents of this town to safety at the tower. Uh, Navani has built this giant floating ship, and uh, they are going to basically try and carry everyone by flying them on this ship. Um, there's a lot of new Fabrial stuff going on. I think that's what a lot of the epigraphs pertain to in this one. During this time, the Fused are there, and they kind of fight. They knew that this thing was going to happen, so Kaladin gets in a big battle. He fights the Pursuer for the first time. He fights Leshwi. He fights, kind of fights Moash again. Um, they're trying to save this guy called the Mink as well during this whole battle. And so you're learning a lot about what's happened in the last year. It's time skipped about a year from Oathbringer towards now. And you, you learn about how combat's been evolving, how the world's been evolving. You know, they haven't reclaimed Kolinar. All this stuff is kind of... Not great, but not terrible either. They lost Herdaz. They lost Herdaz, which is why they're trying to get this mink guy. Um, and generally, it's like somewhat stalemated at this point, the war. Um, and but we so also they... start to see like the advances in technology, right? Because they've built the Bri Bridge 4, which is their kind of flying ship. Right. Well, they built that, and the you know Fuse have these weapons that can kind of dream Stormlight uh, using Ralkales, which is aluminum as well or something yeah or i guess those are different things but whatever there, there's a bunch of advances going on in, in the world um so everyone's trying to you know basically level up to try and win the war um so anyways they managed to basically win the hearthstone battle in some sense they, they get out they're able to save all these people um navani starts getting sketchy messages uh about hey stop stop doing your stuff with fabrials you don't know what you're doing um and so that's all going on they return to the tower and this is where a couple big developments happen. One, Kaladin gets benched. He is relieved of duty by Dalinar because he froze up in that battle. And kind of everyone knows that Kaladin's not right in the head and needs to take some time off. Um, they also realize that uh, they wanted to go try and save Kolinar. They realize that's not the right thing to do. The mink guy that they saved is like, no, no, no. Go to Tukar and beat them up there. Um, so they kind of are elaborating on their battle plans for the year. And also they realize that they need that they're running out of wind runners. There's no new wind runners because they need to convince the honor spread to join their cause and the honor spread are kind of holding out. So they also come up with this envoy, which is going to be Adolin and Shallan to go into Shays Marsh, try and recruit them. I think, I think also in this part is when we find out or we we first meet up back with Venley. And Venley is like you you get introduced to Raboniel, who's this new character, and Venley's gonna help Raboniel. And you start to see like some complexity from the the uh fused at this point too i think yeah this part blends in, I, I finished the book months ago so it blends in my head a little bit if yeah. that happens at the end of part one or beginning of part two I mean, the only regardless. other thing i think yeah regardless the, the only other thing worth noting is that teravangians is a little bit on the outs he's going to be one of our major interlude characters as it builds to the end of his story uh where he is you know no one in, in this side tr trusts him odium doesn't think there's much value in um teravangian anymore so odium's like all right here's what you're going to do when they try and invade me into car because you know you're just going to betray them and try and make as much of a basically uh, a suicide mission. Like, yeah, just make as much of a ruckus as you can. Everybody. And like, it yeah. knows that he's going to get caught and killed. And is this is the deal he made. Yep. So he, he is kind of just like a sad boy for a lot of, there's a lot of sad boys in this book. This is the saddest boys of books. 
uh, which gets us into part two, where around the tower, Kaladin is, you know, one, he's just depressed about all his friends dying. He's depressed about retiring. He just generally suffers from depression. So there's a lot of him trying to cope with all this kind of stuff going on. Um, Shallan is also uh, really struggling to keep her stuff together. They had a little mission to, like, try and assass or capture uh, Sadius's wife, Eli, or whatever her name is. Yeah, Eli, uh, yeah. And, and yeah, she got assassinated, and so, you know, you're not really sure who's doing that. Is it the Ghost Bloods? Is it someone else? And, and a lot of her plot line has to tie into finding out what's going on. Um, while and Ray with sends this, her get... into, is also basically sending her into Shadesmar to do work for the Ghost Bloods, and you're, you're trying to figure out, like, if she's going to actually join the Ghost Bloods or not. Right, there's someone that they want to find who's the leader of the Sons of Honor, they think. And it's like, all right, go find that guy in in where you're going in Shadesmar anyway. So she's kind of doing two birds with one stone with this mission. Yeah. Uh, but she's also really struggling with her identity. Shallan is coming out less and less. It's mostly Vale taking the reins because Shallan just is like, nope, not me. Someone else handle the pressures of life. Uh, so her and Callan are both sad. Adolin's in the middle trying to prop both them up like, hey, everyone, let's be okay. Um, so anyway, they head into their, their Shadesmar journey and there's just some general kind of like, I would say one of the criticisms of this book is maybe some plot cycle spinning about uh, Shallan kind of investigating who on her staff might have been a, potentially the one to assassinate Eli and who might be feeding information to Mraze. And she's like, is it this person? Is it that person? Is yeah, it we, I think we get a sequence of scenes where we cut back between uh, Kaladin being sad, trying to figure out what he's going to do next in his life, and Shallan being sad, trying to deal with all the, the pressure that she's got going on with her. Yep, and eventually um, Kaladin in the tower decides that like his mission is going to be to help other people who have some sort of mental illness because he sees that the Ardents are not treating these people well. They just lock them up in the darkness, and he's like, "This, I know what I'm gonna like. This is how I'm gonna start helping people around the tower is people who are suffering from depression and PTSD and whatever else." Um, so that's their plan. We also get more Venli, and we know that they are the fused are planning to invade the tower and take it over. They have some way of basically changing the tower's self-defense mechanisms to work against the radiance instead of void light in the fused and stuff um, and that invasion happens right at the end right when kaladin is like i got a new purpose in life and it's like just kidding the tower now belongs to the fused um so that kind of leads us into the next section of the book this is when we start getting venley flashbacks which uh kind of cover how she helped the fused kind of start this new desolation the true desolation Navani is just doing tons of science stuff. We are just learning the mechanics of Stormlight and all this different stuff constantly over the course of this book. And like, I, I can't even break down all the developments because it would just be a whole yeah. Fat She's connection. basically unlocking the secrets of the universe. Uh, I guess <laughs> yeah. with, hanging out with Raboniel. So yeah, um, which I don't know. I think we should maybe just mention. So Raboniel is uh, is sort of this like I would say she feels morally ambiguous for a lot of the book and. Uh, she really starts to, her and Venley and Leshwe start to really flesh out what is like the, the the whole situation going on with the fuse, and you start to see situations where like the fuse are tired of the war too, and there's questions about different They're going crazy. A lot of them are going crazy. Uh, Raboniel seems to be very fascinated by like science and unlocking secrets, and maybe less on like conquering, even though she's also kind of like a cold hearted Raboniel. Yeah, and. Um, yeah. And so it's it's very fascinating. Also, I think one thing you, you might not have mentioned is at some point in time, we drop off from the, the Shadesmar trip pretty quickly. It's around there. this part, yeah. yeah. Because... They, uh, there's, one, there's one final thing. Adolin defends Notum, one of the honor spren who's getting attacked by a bunch of Takari. And um, this is like right when they reach lasting integrity. And then they kind of, they reach lasting integrity and it's like, all right, no, we're not going to hear you guys out. And he's like, I'll stand trial for the crimes of the recreants right. if you'll like, then let me, hear me out, potentially. So he's yep. kind of getting tried for all of humanity. And uh, all the, back at the tower, all of the... Uh, radiance? Radiance, thank you. Oh my gosh. All the Jeez. radiance fall asleep except for Lyft and Kaladin. And so then Kaladin's on the run and all that. Yeah, so during this time, it gets taken over. They try to get to the sibling's, like, core, uh, because the sibling has kind of revealed itself at this point as the one that was warning Navani um, about stuff. And there's this crystal core room that activates a self-defense mode. And so Navani's just, like, working with Raboniel to try and find 
uh, secrets of Stormlight and stuff while trying to stop Rabineel from being able to access the core. And th she's working with Kaladin, who's locked away in the tower somewhere, and there are all these another plot, one of these kind of feels like plot cycles where there's four nodes, and one at a time, Rabonial finds a node, and then Kaladin has to go smash it before she's able to use it to take over. And, so you and deal work. with the Pursuer. Deal uh, with which the Pursuer. We didn't really mention. Pursuer is the uh, person, a fuse that Kaladin killed in the very beginning of the book. And the Pursuer, uh, his whole thing is that when somebody kills him, he like does everything he can to go kill that person. So he's desperately trying to kill uh, Kaladin. He's kind of like the... In some ways, like the foil to Robonial, where Robonial is very thoughtful and interested in like figuring out all this stuff, and the pursuer is just like, "I just live to kill." I uh, pursue. Yeah, yes. he, <laughs> very deep character. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But but yeah. So the, the, uh, part three kind of ends with this big reveal where Robonial had been listening in on this kind of communication between Navani and the people who are still alert in the tower. Dabid was also still awake because he wasn't really. Um, a, he, didn't, he didn't have a spren bond. Basically, anyone right. with a spren bond got in trouble. And same with uh, Relaine. Relaine was also okay. So they're kind of like some of the main core of people. Uh, Relaine is also a singer or listener, I guess. So he's he's kind of under undercover. And I think um, this is also when Venley's trying to figure out like her powers, and she's got sort of this identity crisis and of what she's supposed to be doing yeah. exactly. Um, because there's a number of people who are not happy with Odium on the Fuse side. And yeah. Leshley or at least seems to be there. they do, they seem to be questioning the situation. I don't think anyone ever comes out and is like, "Yo, fuck Odium." <laughs> yeah, uh, but Leshwi is clearly like, "I am sick of this," and Rabonial is like, "I will do whatever I can to end the war." And so yeah. they're all you know feeling the stress of it. Uh, so, anyways, they they eventually catch the conversation going on. They find the location of the last um, node. And there's going to be a big showdown in a little bit uh, once once they get there. And Kaladin kind of he can't fly. He's using some like arm mechanic thing, um, using some fabrial science to fly around in some jank way. And he has to like get go through a well in the bottom. And he's kind of ends up outside during a storm and kind of has a, a pretty dark moment. Um, part four starts up. We're back with Shalon um, and Adolin at this trial where he's going to have to answer for the crimes of the humanity for causing the recreants and killing a ton of Spren. Um, and it's a pretty jacked up trial. It's obviously stacked against him. Um, the honor sprint are not all against him. No Tum and some of the younger honor, younger, I think honor sprint are like, nah, man, they're chill. Like right. you get the honor is never dead. So long as it lives in the hearts of men or whatever that, that quote is. Um, so the trial is going back and forth. Shalon figures out that the person that she needs to kill, uh, or like, capture using a dagger for Marais is actually a herald who is the also the high judge of this trial that's going on and she's the pressure gets to her and formless takes over for the first time and we're like oh my god who is formless what is shallan's backstory uh, and this is when we kind of get the big reveal that shallan actually had bonded this friend before uh, i forget what his name was um i think they give it a new name uh they give it a previously new name. it was called pattern she called it pattern back then too so yeah but she she betrayed her oaths and killed him and made him a dead eyes basically and she wasn't able to deal with that but um she kind of is able to overwhelm formless she really is formless is kind of the thing and she integrates some of her split personalities back in into her like yeah, veil, veil goes away she kind of has this moment i think she says does she say the next... Uh, no, she doesn't say the next... Uh, yeah, she, she does, right? She, it's kind of weird with her. We don't... Br Brandon has said it's it's un, like her timeline is wonky because she's sworn oaths, broken oaths, re-sworn oaths, which are really yeah. truths for, for um, her order. And so it's kind of like no one really knows how high up the... But she kind of has this this, ideals. this moment where it's like, are you going to go the crazy path? Go attack this Join person. Join ghost blood. Yeah, yeah. Basically be corrupted and evil and all this stuff. Or are you going to be good and she decides not to and then she talks to the herald and uh and then they get locked away yep um i don't remember if the trial resolves now or not but since we're here i'll just finish it off it does um, yeah yeah it, anyways adolin thinks he's in trouble they bring maya his sword up to be kind of the final uh witness against him and uh, maya overcomes her dead eyeness a little bit and seems to be gaining sentience back and she's like we chose, you know, that's like the big moment. We chose to do the recreants. It wasn't that humans forced them to do it. Humans didn't break the bond. It was a mutual decision by the, the Radiant Yeah, no betrayal. Then. Yeah, there, there was no betrayal. And so that kind of somewhat clears his name, but they still kind of get captured. It gets a little it gets a little wonky. But in the end, everything works out <laughs> to, yeah. to, to skip past some of that stuff. Um, 
Meanwhile, at the tower, things seem really dark. It feels like they're going to lose. Uh, Kaladin has a falling out with his dad, who's kind of been around. His dad's learning to accept Kaladin for who he is, even though he kills. And there's that whole family drama going on. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about, I think, is what that by this point in time in the story, ter- like the Dalinar uh, Teravangian oh, right. stuff has just sort of been going on every now and then, and the Teravangian betrayal occurs. And. Uh, and he's locked away and is trying to sort of figure out what he's going to do next. I forget what part in the interlude is that, that it becomes clear that Teravangian thinks he has a way to fuck over Odium because Odium can't see what's going on with, um, not really. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ren- Renarin. Renarin. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So he does his betrayal. He gets locked away for it. He talks to Odium as well at one point, And they're both kind of like, even Odium's a little bit of a sad boy in this book, where he's like, "Oh man, no one understands me. What it's like being a god." As raised. yeah, you start you start to realize that there's just a whole lot that is fracturing on the Odium side. Like Ray's the the holder, the vessel for Odium is like kind of getting desperate. He's getting desperate because he put all his his chips in on the Dalinar train, and then Dalinar beat him essentially in the last book, and he is and they're trying to force a. Uh, odium into a point where he has to like take a deal and like the fused are kind of like losing faith and just like you get the feeling that actually things are not as desperate as it seemed perhaps for our heroes yeah um so anyways he like you said also teravangian realized there's a way to potentially uh beat up odium and he's like he's telling dalnar to bring the sword into the dream but no one trusts teravangian at this point uh, to bring Nightblood into the dream. But because no one trusts Odium, it's a little unsure how this is going to work. And he, he like is doing some things that he doesn't realize are kind of manipulating a situation that's going to help him out. Um, so anyways, into the, the Sandra Lanch. We find out that Wit and Yasna are, are in up. a relationship. Yeah. A, um, They're fuck buddies. That's not clear. She doesn't seem to have a physical attraction. To yeah, yeah. So I think she's, uh, Brandon Sanderson confirmed she's asexual. But right. I think, but, but I think not they're still doing stuff. She's just like not feeling it. Yeah, I think she's. I think the proper term for her would be like a sex neutral, a uh, but not a romantic ace. Sure. But I think that's the the right uh, identification. Anyways, We're, yeah. <laughs> um. So the the Sandra Lynch kind of starts. Callan has his big show off with a bunch of the forces of the fused in the tower. Um. And Moash is there now trying to mess with him because he thinks he can maybe corrupt him to Odium side or at least get him to kill himself for something. You know, uh, Moash just basically wants Kaladin to to feel like he does, uh, to tear him down. So Kaladin ends up killing the Pursuer in a pretty brutal way, rips his head off. Teft ends up dying. Yikes. Um, Moash and then, kills Teft, yeah. Yeah, Moash kills Teft, throws him off like a roof or whatever. Kind no, of, I think he just stabs, he stabs him. Yeah, but then he throws the body off to. Oh yeah, he throws Kaladin. it into the sky and it falls in front of Kaladin. Yeah. Kaladin just collapses in on himself, and then, and then Moash is like, "Nobody fuck with Kaladin. If you touch him, it's gonna go bad for everyone. Just let him be sad." And then the pursuer is like, nah, "I'm the pursuer." <laughs> yeah, um, and then also I think uh, Moash takes Kaladin's dad up on the roof and like throws him off the roof and Kaladin has to dive into the storm. No, 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 not, not, it's a different, it's one of Leshwe's, Leshwe's people here. Oh. I'll, I'll take over for here. You take uh, over. Then. So, so Sandra Lanch is hitting and we, we know that everything's coming to a head. Uh, Venley is realizing that Leshwe is like, perhaps not as, um, odiumed as she seems. And, uh, Venley's having this kind of like cognitive dissonance around, like is she finds out that her par- people are still alive. And so she's going to go off and try to like save her people. Cause she's been sitting for all these books thinking that she was the one that like screwed them over that they were all dead. And so she's going to leave and Relaine is like, I'm going to hang out and still help. And then, uh, we, we also at the same time have, uh, Rabonial and Navani coming to a head because by this point in time, Navani has learned some really big stuff. Uh, it happens slowly over time, but just to kind of recap some of it, she's found out that like void light exists essentially, or void light exists, but also there's like anti light. So anti storm light, anti anti investiture, anti investiture, and also that you can combine uh, different investiture um in different ways and so that's how that's the name rhythm of war comes from that because they write this book called rhythm of war that's about uh the sound that's emitted from 
the investiture of honor and odium being combined. And so around this time, Rabonial basically fucks over Navani and is saying, like, I'm going to go kill all of the uh, Radiance because now I know how to permanently kill invested Spren or Spren. And also she kills her own daughter because you find out that she's been wanting her insane daughter to be kind of released for a long time. It's a big emotional moment. She uses this dagger to basically stop. Like, basically now things can be permanently destroyed because Investor to her can be permanently destroyed. So at the same time, uh, Navani's realizing... What? Go ahead. You take over. Oh, no. I was going to uh, okay, we got off the Caladus well, well, so story. Let's start So I'm trying to, to build the, the standard lunch all together. No one cares about building a standard it all lunch comes in, a, together. in a video review. So it Kaladin, all comes together. Let's just wrap up storylines. Let's get okay, these out of the way. We're not saying- loses his, gets really angry because his, his dad gets grabbed and he starts to go psycho. He kills the pursuer in a very brutal way. And then Leshwi's like group is like, oh God, runs off with the, the dad up to the top of the tower uh, he, Kaladin chases up there. One of them freaks out, throws the dad over the side, and Kaladin has the crazy moment that's been building for so long where he's falling and falling and falling, and he's basically giving up because he's like, well, I can't protect my dad. I can't protect Teft. Like, this is the moment where I give up. And then Dalinar with the Stormfather come in and give uh, Kaladin basically like a vision of his, his brother. It's somewhat unclear on the dynamics of it where his brother basically like forgives him and he comes to terms and has this whole moment. He swears his oath, goes and saves his dad, now has armor and comes back into the fight as like mega Kaladin ready to, to fuck some people up. Yep. He has a living uh, plate now, a shard plate, uh, which he can kind of command to do things. He basically frees the tower. Um, during this time, like you said, the kind of Leshwi, and uh, Rulane and Venli all kind of like this third group kind of emerges of listeners who are like, man, F Odium, F humans, we're going to go our own way. And they kind of head out into the Shattered Plains and use the, the Oath Gates to get out of there. Uh, we're not quite sure what their, their path is going to be from this point on. There seems to be a, a domesticated chasm fiend out of nowhere. Um, so that seems to be a, a third party kind of in this war emerging a little bit. Um, during this time, Navani also bonds the sibling. Um, despite the sibling not kind of liking Navani for a lot of the book, ends up knowing that she's the best match. And they use this bond to kind of cleanse the tower, turn its activation back on. Now they're able to kind of defeat the fuse with Kaladin also leveling up. Navani blinds uh, Moash and sends him out of there. Moash has a a moment where he just feels like other crap and uh, is super sad. Also, Dalinar meets Ishar, who after winning the war in Tukar with Yasna, uh, they kind of meet him. To try and like be like, hey, you're a master bondsmith. Why don't you teach me? Because Dalinar's like, I definitely need to get better at my powers to, to win this war. Ishar's full nutso uh, has uh, kind of the same problem that a lot of the, the fused are having, which is they go a little crazy over the course of their long lives and multiple rebirths kind of thing that seems to happen. Um, and so Ishar attacks him. Uh, and Seth kind of saves Dalinar. He learns that his dad's alive. He has a, a crisis. He goes and storms it to Teravangian's home to be like, man, Teravangian, what the F? And just like during that time, Odium also shows up. Well, Teravangian really quickly, go- right before this, we should say Dalinar also made a deal with Odium finally to like basically, I think in one week from then have... 10 days, yeah. 10 days, sorry. 10 days have a battle to decide basically the fate of Roshar where... It's it's not winner takes all, but it basically would end the war for one in favor of one or the other. Yeah, there's a bunch of like little restrictions and, and kind of rules that they put on it. But anyway, Teravangian goes into the dream with Odium, pulls out Nightblood, kills Rays, and ascends to take over as the uh, vessel of Odium. During this time, Cultivation shows up and she's like, "Hey, bro, my plan worked. Now you're the vessel, and we're gonna be chill, right?" And and Teravangian is like, in his own head, no. Uh, he doesn't. He kind of wants to now that he's in a position of power again. Continue saving Roshar, but his version of saving seems pretty messed up at this point. Um, but he doesn't want anyone to know that he's the new Odium. So he kind of continues to agree with this plan that Dalinar made, uh, which kind of leads into the epilogue where he's trying to pull a mind game on Wit and not let Wit know that Raze is no more. And 
Todium is is the new force. Uh, and there's some weird shenanigans there with memory and stuff, but that kind of closes out the book. The ter- tower is safe. Kaladin Shashbrand is finally gone. He's sworn his fourth ideal. He seems to have accepted himself and his role in the war, but he's not necessarily back. Uh, Odium is is now led by a new force for the first time. And the other major thing, I guess, would be uh, Shallan is, is kind of form now and and probably the the honor sprinter are kind of down with humans and some of the sprint are coming more around to the cause again and i and i just raised this one thing because i think it's important for people that are going to be watching this right before book five ishar has been doing some weird stuff where he's been pulling spren out of the cognitive realm they die yeah. like immediately but they're actually like existing in the sort of the form that they would have in the cognitive realm so it seems as though he's trying to figure out a way to like convert cognitive creatures or whatever into uh physical realm creatures yeah he's experimenting on them yeah. uh, so there's a lot of stuff pointing towards uh like advancements in the war still in terms of like the fact that you can now kill cognitive shadows permanently versus just trapping them in gemstones yeah um so anyways that that concludes most of the plot points for this book and, and the recap section for rhythm of war okay so some big picture stuff here in uh this I, I, before we get into things that we dislike and things that we like uh, obviously, like Kaladin's wearing his big ideal, uh, Shallan figuring out what's going on with her and then all the stuff, the Recreants not being a betrayal, um, Teravangian ascending. Like, there's some huge stuff that happens all, by the way, at the very end of this book, um, but there's some huge moments, I think. And also even just the investiture stuff. I mean, we don't, we, we're don't. we going to probably talk about spoilers as related to other things at the very end of this, so don't worry for now, but there are some big ramifications for sort of the magic system here as it relates to some of the other magic systems that we've seen in some of other Cosmere works. Yeah. This is, this is the most interconnected book we have ever had in the Cosmere thus far. Yes. Uh, Maybe like secret history or some of those ones you could argue, but for the most part, this is, this is the most, so we'll try and avoid any spoilers for now, but we'll have to talk about at the end. Um, But yeah, I think there, there are a lot of answers to Oathbringer questions and Oathbringer situations that got, you know, fulfilled in this book. And I think it sets up book five really well with this figure L that's kind of hinted at and uh, the new Teravangian and this contract in the 10 days thing, you know, book five is, is set up for a lot of these big questions. We know it's the book where we go to Shinovar when Seth just kind of got this big motivation to go back there. Um, and th- there's been a lot of like really big forward momentum towards the end of this book to push you into book five. It did feel yeah. kind of like a setup book almost. For they book solved five. they solved a lot of stuff from the previous books, and then I feel like they answered or they set up raised some questions for the next one, which I guess is what you're going to do in any good book. But it does feel like everything is coming to a head in the next one. And for those that haven't been paying attention, it's a ten book series, but it's supposed to basically wrap up most of. It's split into two. With so the time it's supposed to wrap middle. up a lot, I think, after the next the next one and raise and have a lot of questions. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Okay, things we did not like. There's a lot yes. for me. Yeah, I would I think... say this this is probably my least favorite Stormlight book. Um, and I'll say it didn't have some of the low lows that like Oathbringer had for me, where like I was just outright bored in Kolinar, and like I was like, get me the hell out of here. But I also didn't feel like it had a lot of the high highs, and it had a lot more like death by paper cuts kind of things that that bothered me over the course of it. Yeah, I so I still really like the book. I'm not Same. saying I don't. I think we we both really liked it, but I think both of us were. I don't I don't know if this is the the weakest for me, but it's definitely like second to weakest if it's not the weakest. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't find there were sections that were as boring as is Colinar, but. I read this during a kind of a longer road trip and there was a section of like 10 hours of my road trip where it felt like nothing happened. And that's basically everything right before the tower gets taken. Uh, because I just kind of felt like we were really mired in Kaladin stuff, really mired in Shalon stuff. Mark and I have talked about this before between the two of us. Mark is like, well, this is how it's going to be for Kaladin. He suffers from depression and stuff. For me, it's just like, you're giving me a lot of the same stuff I've got from these other books. And so it's just hard for me when it feels like so much of the stuff weighs down the plot from getting progressed, because I really felt like the time in which Shalon is sitting and Shadesmar on her, her journey, Kaladin's trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Navani's just sort of sitting around trying to figure out what's going on, like who's contacting her. It just felt like the plot really stalled out for a while. Yeah. I think um, it didn't bother me as much in a, 
reading form because you can kind of get through with stuff faster i think so like 10 hours on a road trip is much worse than i don't know four hours like like a day of reading because I was, I was jamming through it you know right um i also just don't mind the like more sit back with the character and watch him brood a little bit considering this is basically his most defining characteristic as a, as a human you know um and as someone who knows a lot of people with depression i'm like i i can understand this a lot more uh and so, like, it never bothered me. Um, what bothered me more was actually part one. I thought the battle went on for so long in Hearthstone. And, like, I've realized that sometimes Brandon just writes action scenes for too long for me. That they just feel, like, gamified where it's, like, three hits, break the armor. Or, like, you know, in Oathbringer, that battle just went on forever where it's, like, Kaladin, hit <laughs> Amaram. All oh, right, now we'll go, go somewhere else. And then this was another one where it's, like, okay, he fights Leshui twice, I think. He fights the Pursuer twice, I think. And he kind of gets into that situation with Moash. And this whole time, there's this like, battle going around. And it's just sometimes I'm like, get me out of this battle. I don't care. I know it's like I know what's going to happen. And so like this, that part was actually the most sloggy for me in the entire book was actually this like action sequence Which I, I quite enjoyed getting back into it uh, that way. I think also just because I knew that there was going to be a lot more book ahead, I was kind of enjoying in that moment having, having that stuff. I also liked all the kind of tech stuff that got figured out. Like when they show up with with the the fourth bridge and all that stuff the ship uh i yeah. thought it was really cool i think uh, for you and i all the science and cosmere stuff did not bother us which i know it has bothered some people but fabrials talk talk my ear off i don't care it's interesting yeah to me. mark and i both really really enjoy magic systems and so having a book where they sit heavily with it i will say halfway through the book mark had already finished it and i was talking to him and i was suggesting that it's like they are re like they went brandon went really hard in the paint on uh, <laughs> some of the stuff where he's just like you know it's like you know navani would solve one mystery and then get like three more opened up in front of her and i'm like wow we are really complicating this magic system where there's like void light and then there's anti-investiture and then there's life light life and, light, then and there's tower light which is the combination war light. of both and then there's sounds like i understand i am like I, I'm surprised Brandon is doing it because this book, his series is now broken out to be such a, like, I don't want to say it's mainstream, right? But it's like, you have a very wide audience. And so this feels like the type of stuff that's almost very uh, niche. niche, I guess I would say for the people. Yeah. Who are really into yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I liked it all. I like Navani's characters. So, like I never minded being in her head as she's learning this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, one of the other things that bothered me, I think, would be Venley, which is kind of uh, she's supposed to like this is supposed to be her book, and it felt like Navani's book. Navani had the flashback in the beginning with what happened on the night of Gavilar's assassination. She's the one making the biggest developments in the plot in Cosmere Discoveries. She's getting a ton of page time. She ends up being a bondsmith by the end of the book. You know, like this yeah. is this is a Navani book. This is not. I don't care that the flashback sequence was Venley. I mean, especially because if Venley does like virtually nothing for the first half of the book, I feel like like she's basically just observing what's going on with the fused, and it's not like an act. She doesn't really feel like an active participant in the plot in any way. Yeah, I mean, she she's like gathering her little squad of like dissenters a little bit, but that's about it. She's like, I'm gonna make a third like people who are gonna remember the listeners. That's right. like her goal, which is a pretty small scale goal until the end of the book when she realizes that like, hey, I, I might have more allies and I can make, maybe actually pull off making a third faction yeah which is so, cool but but it took a lot to and the flashbacks did not reveal anything really new to the world right you get a little bit of backstory on like how it was that the fuse like broke in essentially and and what was going on back then but yeah you're right it's it is it's nothing i mean let's put it this way following up on oathbringer which i think is like having dalinar and all the revelations around him and his flashbacks and all that stuff and then going to sort of this book, like these books sort of as a concept of, okay, well, each one is based on a character and you're going to learn a lot about their backstory. You went from the strongest example of that, uh, in my opinion, to just like the weakest where it's like this one almost kind of felt forced or like it, it was falling off. I, I still liked Venley. I thought she was a good character and stuff, but I just, yeah, it definitely did feel like this was in some ways more Navani's book. Yeah. Um, some of the other things that, so i actually this was a book like i said it didn't have many lows for me like along the way i was i was chugging through it just fine i never felt like i had to really force myself to get through it but like by the end 
and I'm like sitting through all the reveals, I would say a number of things just felt off to me. I, I don't know how, how to put it, but like, I don't, I don't know if you felt the same way, but like the Sander Lanch did not land for me the way that normally the Sander Lanch lands. In, and I'm like freaking out and I'm fist pumping. I'm like, oh my God, this, oh my God, that. Like it was, it was herky jerky. Like Teravangian is ascending and we're getting directly cut to falling action from the tower. Like after it's purified. You yeah. know, and after after everything's fine, it's like I can't cathartically release of like these characters finally being in the clear while like some of the most important Cosmere stuff we've ever seen on page is happening. It's like it's just like tonal whiplash and like also yeah. the stuff with Dalinar and Teravangian just did not feel like it got as much page time as it should have gotten, considering how big all that stuff was, compared to like Kaladin went to the third node and broke the third node. Yeah. I I agree with you in, in a lot of ways. Um, I definitely feel like it was really weird the way that the Teravangian section was, his ascension happens and then it's just sort of like casually thrown in, intermixed between all the stuff as you mentioned. I think the other thing that felt weird is like the, I don't know how to describe it, but it's almost like we had too much rising action. Like compared to the Sander Lanch of last year, which is, or last book, which is, the Battle of Thalen Field, and suddenly, like, Teravangian's betrayal becomes a thing, and Dalinar is, like, forced out, and you start to realize, like, wait, wait, where are the baddies? Like, all this stuff hits at once in a way where, like, a lot of this was fairly telegraphed. Like, you knew that uh, there was going to be a showdown between Kaladin and the Pursuer. You knew that things were coming to a, like, a, a head with the, the sibling trial. and Navani and all this stuff. Like, I actually, you mentioned the trial. I thought that, like, the Shallan and Adolin stuff, which gets handled a little bit prior to the, the main Sander Lanch, I thought that was really, really good. But, yeah, I, I agree a lot with, with what you're saying. And I still am trying to decide how I feel about the Kaladin sort of breakthrough moment because it didn't feel... I think we've seen that so frequently from Kaladin where he's, like, sad, and then he, like, triumphs over his sadness, and then... Like, we're good, you know? And so I think, I know that that's like a pivotal foundational moment for the series that, that Brandon, and I'm not saying I disliked it. It's just like, to your point, it didn't feel like it really hit as climactically yeah. for, for me. I think it was, in a lot of ways, the most predictable book. Um, and the unpredictable parts, like the Teravangian Ascension and like Ishar and like Dalnar stuff, that all felt like the subplots in this book. And like, the most surprising stuff was all in the subplots. It was not the main plot, yeah. um, which I think is why it felt that way. Because like, oh my God, Adolin gets out of his trial because Maya awakens. It was like, the foreshadowing was really well done. I loved reading Adolin, like teaching Maya to brush the horse and like, you know, but it was so obvious what was going to happen, especially when they brought her out. Well, especially like to your, I remember you mentioned this to me previously, like a lot, like it, the foreshadowing in a lot of these places was very heavy handed. Like you said, the foreshadowing was really well done. And in some ways I agree, but in another way it's like, by the way, here's another Spren saying that Spren that are, our dead eyes can't talk. <laughs> by the way, did you remember Spren that our dead eyes can't talk? Like, by the way, Seth's sword disguised Nightblood, the special <laughs> sword behind Alinar. You know, like yeah, I, yeah. yeah. There's just a lot of like, uh, I guess Chekhov's guns or something like that, right? Where it's just like, okay. We get it. The gun is on the mantle. Like you mentioned this a couple times now. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I I don't know if that like in the beta reads or something like that, people were forgetting this, or if it's just like I do worry that the book series is becoming so complicated that Brandon might feel like he has to like really hold readers' hands through some of the stuff that has been like discussed pretty frequently in the previous books. But um, yeah, I, I definitely felt that stuff um, a lot with this. Well, and I think even beyond just Chekhov's guns, like a lot of the predictable plot cycles, like okay, there's four nodes, you know. <laughs> that yeah. that they're going to try and hijack and it's just they go to a node there's a conflict they obviously don't win because there's half a book left and then you know like it comes down to the fourth node and that's when Kaladin wins and like there's a lot of this kind of just like plot spinning cycles to get you to the point that you know you're getting to anyways yeah. and I've seen this discussion a lot online too but you and I both talked about it I think the we don't really do much in terms of going places this book like we yeah. spend almost the entire book at the tower um and the like we spend some of it in shadesmar but like the shadesmar stuff felt until you get into the city 
it felt so much like the previous books. Like we're on a we're boat, on a boat. Sheets, Mar, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out what's going on. And then we get virtually nothing of what's going on in Takar. Like there's a sequence with, uh, Yasna where she's like running in and doing her battle scene and stuff like that but like virtually nothing other than that so uh, I think were you the one that was like I don't ever want to go spend eight of our time at I'm I am done with the tower yeah. we were looking for the tower in book one we found it in book two book three was like figuring out how it's going to work book four we finally made it work get me out of the tower yeah, yeah. I understand it's like the headquarters are really important but like at this point yeah. I just hope we don't have the final showdown between like Odium and Honor's forces at, at the top of the tower. I and feel like, like the battle will take place. I know the tower. it's gonna. T- I know, and I'm like, please no. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I'd say about the plot stuff, because I agree about the setting. Like, I, why didn't we see more of Takar? Like, we saw one battle and like the inside of a tent. You know, it felt yeah. kind of lame. Um, but I think the plot conveniences as well. There's a number of things that just felt like they had. Like, some guy builds a thing to help Kaladin fly, and it's just like. This guy should really be working on other stuff, but I got to let my scientists do whatever they want. And, oh, what do you know? My scientists happen to make the perfect device for when they lose his power to fly. And, like, yeah. everyone... Or, lo- or Moray's being like, I really need you to go to Lasting Integrity, this fortress that no one can get into, and is, like, a huge commitment that would be very obvious if you decided to just bail and go there. And the next scene is like, we need to send a crew to Lasting Integrity. And it's like... Well, that's convenient yeah. that five minutes ago, Mraze told me I needed to do this. You know, I think this thing knocks out all the radiant powers except for Kaladin because he's just yeah. kind of closer to the fourth ideal. And you so everyone's kind of, knocked out almost, but him. You almost kind of wish that Mraze had been like, hey, I've got intelligence that they're going to send a group to lasting integrity. We've been trying to get there for a long time. You need to make sure you're in that group. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there are ways to have made it. Like, Mraze is this information dealer. Like, you can add the mystery of, like, how did he know this, et cetera. Like, uh, yeah. they said they had somebody close to Dalinar. You know, like, there's there's a lot of interesting ways that they could, uh, Brandon could have done it. And I'm just sort of surprised in some areas and the places where he was just like, YOLO. Um, huge fan, by the way. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I'm, talk- I mean, we sound really negative, And I'm about to throw one more onto the pile. Oh, boy. Just- okay. And then we got to go to positive. Right, right. Uh, so the final negative thing I'll say is I felt like a lot of the final p- like plot reveals in the Sander Lanch, also upon reflection, I did not like. Um, there was a red herring that like maybe Rulane will be the Bondsmith. And as a guy who has felt sort of in the background for a long time, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. There's a third party coming in. You know, like the the sibling said that sh- she, it, likes Rulane. Like, I was ready for that, and instead it's Navani. And I like Navani as, like, the normal badass trope who is just, like, an awesome scientist who, like, was contributing to the war effort in her own way without having magical powers, kind of like Adolin. And I was just bummed that she became the Bondsmith, and, like, that was all just a big red herring. And I understand, like, Relaine as the Bondsmith of the Night Radiant headquarters would have been weird for, like, the third-party thing, but I was still disappointed by that. I was I was disappointed that t- Odium just fucking died at like he had yeah. no on-screen victory in the series he has he he got outsmarted left and right he couldn't corrupt dalinar he couldn't corrupt kaladin he, he never won a battle on screen kolinar didn't feel like his own doing that felt more like the unmade doing that or you know the, the fused and so like odium just looks like this big pushover and he's supposed to have killed four shards prior to the series they're splintered them and he just did nothing the whole time and just died. same with pursuer you're supposed to be scared of him but the pursuer never accomplished anything on screen like so, Rabonio was a great villain, but these two villains sucked, and I, I don't care that Odium died in Terra Vangie and I think that's really cool for the series, and kind of came out of left field, but like the fact that Odium got played almost for laughs in this book, where it's like, ha, Raze is actually an idiot. <laughs> so I, this is a good moment to pivot, because one, you and I talked about this previously, and then I saw, a, I think, Shardcast, uh, Brandon Sanderson did like an episode with them, and one of the things he mentioned in that, whether you disagree or agree, but at least it's a reasoning is like he felt like he had to kill Ray's because he knew that Ray's had been defeated by Dalinar and he knew that Kaladin was not going to fall to him in this book. So he felt like that would be a defeat. And so he felt like his villain was just never going to be good enough to like to accomplish anything and, and be evil enough, I guess. And so he's like, well, if he gets defeated twice, you can't have him get defeated again in the next book. And so um, then I think that's why he said he felt like he needed to have Terra Vangian come up because, like, Ray's had, to your point, become 
kind of neutered. So it's just a punching bag. Like he yeah. just loses every battle. Um, so yeah, I mean, doesn't make me feel a ton better about it. Just kind of made me sad that like this force, which is by all means the scariest thing in the Cosmere up until this point, taken care of. I mean, yep. to quote to quote one of the uh, epitaphs, and I don't think I'll say who it is in the epitaph because that would be a spoiler for another series. But um, the it's not you know Rays is not, not the scariest the thing. It's it's odium, which is the scariest thing, the power. So right, and oh. that's fair. But you also made odium kill four shards, and it's like the basis for things that have happened in other series Rays, as well. Yeah, excuse me, Rays. So, so I don't know. It's just, okay. it's just things that we liked. Things that we liked. Uh, Raboniel is one of the best characters Brandon Sanderson has ever made. Uh, yes, I think, and I I really felt like his like at first I thought, oh, he's going to spend a bunch of time with the fuse, and now we're going to like have this whole sequence where we realize that the fused are kind of complicated and stuff. But then he really pulled it off. I thought that like Leshwe telling Kaladin like let's let's create a a better union of our people and like let's end this war and like. Raboniel having like the daughter thing, really trying to like encourage Navani to be the sign or the scholar that Navani doesn't think she is. Like uh, all the stuff that like, I, ironically I thought Venley was one of the least interesting um, singer slash fused characters in the book uh, because the other ones I think were just pretty good. Obviously pursuer is not pursuer hold is a, ha, is exists for a reason, but is not particularly an interesting character. Yeah. Um, I thought his power was cool. I, yes. I think like everything to do with the magic systems and the evolution of what people can do and whatnot, it's all cool. I like all of it. Um, I think all that stuff was, was still a big W. Same with like the world building or I guess a magic system building. Yeah. We, you know, we said maybe it's going to bother some people, but for us, I was like, give me, give me more tendies, give me more crumbs, give me more, you know, more. I do worry it gets really complicated. Like I, I, I like it a lot in this book. I'm wondering what it looks like in like, book, book nine. eight of the storm yeah exactly <laughs> or like the the later mistborn series or stuff like that where you start having like anti-investiture i think just he he in that that podcast i referenced earlier he was saying he felt like he needed some sort of force because in, in stormlight people are very like essentially op right like they can just heal so much and like fuse can always come back and all that stuff so he needed some way to kind of have some counter lever to that especially as people start to figure out more and more and more to do with this but um, I think it is kind of just like weird. Also, it seems really easy to make anti-investiture. So that was probably the only part of that where I was like, "Huh? Like you just sing, and it, you know, that's yeah, I it." Mean, presu presumably, you can just create vast troves of anti-investiture, right? So it's like, is that what we're going to see in the next book or in book six or something like that? Where you they're just making like, like huge nukes armies. of like, yeah anti-investiture bombs yeah exactly so i mean i could see it going that Lasting way and integrity I... gets nuked uh by <laughs> a there's a hole bomb. in the yeah. in the cognitive realm yeah. yeah i don't know i mean all that stuff's interesting but it did seem a little like if yeah. someone just has a violin that play or like a string that play i don't know yeah uh, the other i mean it's just literally just like <laughs> go away moash i'm just playing my <laughs> instrument <laughs> You're, you're, faha, listen to this music, you idiot. Uh, Bards are the most OP class now. It's literally just um, just people walking around with Sony Walkmans. Like I, I made this joke to you. It's like I'm just gonna pick up my phone and play like the anti void light song and like get get owned fused. Yeah, so, um, I think that's interesting. But I did like the magic system a lot. I do like how he's continuing to progress it. Yeah, I thought the Adolin trial stuff, even though a little predictable, I actually liked it. Really like, I good. Thought, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you could. As well, I did not think that the Shalon stuff or the Adolin stuff, you said predictable, but like, like we knew that Maya was going to say something, but what she said, I think was really great. And I think the, the reveal around Shalon, I did not anticipate. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of most quotable line from this book, because in our interview, he, he talked about like making sure that some of his like big moment lines, he, he goes through one more time to make sure it's yeah. like cool, kind of like that. You cannot have my pain line. I think the we chose would be a yeah. line from this book for me much more than like, <laughs> Navani's cringy <laughs> life before death, you bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> Just... thing is, like, that Navani line, I think, will resonate with a lot of people and then not resonate with a lot of people. But that, yeah. that line and also the the honor's not dead so long as it lives in the hearts yeah. of men, I think, will be like, that's something that will be on a t shirt at some point in time. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought the, the whole thing there was cool. I, I'm curious to see, like, 
I, are we ready for the spoiler section? Not not just yet. I want to say okay. a couple other things that I thought were good. For what we did see of what was going on in Takar, I actually really enjoyed a lot of it. Like the Yasna scene was really well written, even though it felt weird like to just kind of teleport in and have that. I think everything that like Wit is involved with is really interesting, and I never would have mm-hmm. anticipated like Wit and Yasna becoming like even setting aside the nature of their relationship or whatever, like the fact that Wit seems to finally be like trusting people enough to like humanized talk. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought that was really neat, and I, I don't know. I thought I thought that a lot of that stuff was was really good, um, and I really enjoyed that. And I did also really enjoy, even though I felt like the time before it was a little too long and the buildup was a little too long, and I felt like the occupation felt like a little too much. I enjoyed sort of the concept of of forcing the two groups to be stuck together and the invasion and all that stuff I thought was, was really interesting and a good part I love, of the story. I love that people just call it diehard Stormlight, you know, because it's it's pretty much what it is. And I, I think it's a, a perfect, like, comparison for, yeah. for what, what that is. And it, it, I liked it, you know, like, I overall liked the idea of this invasion having the one man versus the world kind of thing, with, uh, you know, obviously with Nabani supporting and stuff right. and doing her own thing. But, like this guy just going through the tower and being this thorn in their side that they can't seem to find. It's, it's all really cool. It's just, like you said, maybe a little long or whatnot. Yep. So I thought, I thought all that stuff was pretty great. And then I think you and I should just have a discussion on how we feel about the Teravangian Ascension. Cause you seem to like it, I think more than I do. Yeah. What, what I, do you I, like about it? Do you, I like, it, would it be in your list of positives, I guess, for this book? Yeah, I mean, I don't like that Odium was such a loser, right? Um, but I don't mind that he that there's this kind of shift where Teravangian takes over. He's been augmented by cultivation in some way. We don't know exactly how that's going to impact him as a vessel, um, exactly. But um, that he seems to be, at least as presented in the book, as a more competent person to fulfill Odium's intent of being divine hatred, which is supposedly according to someone the scariest part but that ray seemed to be going a little becoming unhinged and not being able to do that and taking bad deals and odium and teravangian is this fresh new vessel ready to to make stuff happen yeah uh, i think um i'm i'm a little curious about how it goes with cultivation because i feel like the sort of way in which uh teravangian's like she had no idea what she did after cultivation was like oh good i got you to ascend it like the moment, like she seems to think her plan worked. Mm-hmm. Terror of Angie seems to think it didn't. And so in my mind, my takeaway is that that means that like, this is kind of the counterbalance to cultivation being the kind of like days ex machina from the previous book um, where it's just like, Oh, Dalinar just managed to, you know, it all worked out and she, it was her plan all along. This so what was don't also you like a, about it? it all worked out and this was her plan all along. But I think the idea is that this, this one didn't go as well as the previous one. Right, but what what don't you like about it? Because you say you didn't you didn't like Teravangian. Okay, yeah. So I I think I'm undecided on it. It does feel a little contrived to me, uh, which I get is like a word that people use. In it. But I just mean like it, it, you you have all these forces that are operating at this like god level, and you have these people trying to kind of overcome it. And like Teravangian's character was always one that was like. I'm going to try to do what's best for my people. And it, it, he talked a lot about like his whole stance on morality was I am here to, to, to like make the decisions other people can't, because I know that that's what's for the best for my people. And so him just kind of being like, yeah, I killed you. And then just like taking the power for himself, I think is, it's a little weird. Also, like, I just feel like it's going to be weird when Dalinar is like, Oh, you're, Teravangian like it, it just feels like such a it feels like a I don't want to say a stretch but like he's stretching this character a lot by putting him there I'm not saying I'm it's going to be like a issue a huge issue for me going forward but I definitely feel like it's not what I I, I felt like at least that he didn't put the steps in in place for me to take that change as well as I could have maybe as I guess a good way to put it so I definitely agree that I wish there was more Teravangian throughout the book. He's been one of my favorite characters, and I think he's maybe one of these characters where his internal monologue, you know, he's a bit of an unreliable narrator, because yeah. if you look at his actions from the outside, everything he has done has been to gain power. 
um, in the inside, he justifies like, I'm the only one who'll make these decisions. Heavy lies the crown. I'm so it's such a burden to rule. And in the meantime, he's fueling Warren Jacoved to like become an ascension there. He's trying to undermine Dalinar's coalition so he can become the head of it. He's doing this messed up stuff in the uh, Carbronth to be this ruler. And, you know, the fact that he got caught doing this stuff and put him in a position where all he could do was kind of tuck his tail between his legs and serve Odium. I don't think, I, I mean, I'm of the belief that like Teravangian was always kind of lying to himself and just kind of. Yeah. I guess I idea. feel like the, the fact that he was down to sacrifice himself at the end means that he was doing it for moral reasons. Like he had, he was basically like, fine, I'll just end uh, and die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, he's complicated in that way, so who knows? But like, I kind of yeah. can see this idea that like he's always wanted power and used his own justifications, and now that he has, you know, the ultimate power, he's like, man, it's time to start cleaning house and taking over stuff. All right, so this for the here, we'll wrap up the video for this part. So if you've been watching, the next part is going to be about spoilers for what do you want to say for all Cosmere or all Cosmere spoilers? All Cosmere spoilers. So if you've enjoyed this. Thank you. Please subscribe to the channel. I know it's, we always go quite long on these, but hopefully it's helped uh, you recap if it's a couple of years from now and you want to recap on it or you've just enjoyed it. Uh, but thanks for watching. And here's where we go into the great beyond. Which may or may not exist. Spo spoilers here. Okay, so uh, let's let's go all in. What do you, what do you think? Well, so I think... Um... I'm interested in like all the Cosmere implications as always from this book. I think it did a lot of really cool things to set some of this stuff up, namely Kelsier as the leader of the ghost bloods, trying to figure out how to solve this cognitive set shadow issue, which Hoyd maybe has the answer to, as well as like they're trying to capture Stormlight to become a fuel source for other magic systems. Like I think it sets up like the kind of like future problems of the Cosmere quite well of these like forces on different planets interacting with each other. Well, and Ishar, is, uh, Ishar is trying to pull like cognitive uh creatures through too so i feel like that also somewhat links into the kelsier stuff right like the identity like Kel cognitive shadows and everything they are is a huge part because they also can get trapped in gemstones which seems to have happened to bo adam mishram and like has yeah. big consequences for roshar as a whole and like there's this pure tone stuff that seems interesting and like how anti-void light manifests against other things like i don't know all that stuff raises a lot of big questions and even um our our boy the ardent from Sahel. warbreaker yeah he even is talking a lot about how he's like not even sure if he's still alive or if he is just like a shadow of him, himself on this planet so right and i think like all that stuff is really interesting to me um i think this is like we said the most interconnected book so it's even hard to like remember all the references of like what did that mean again here i think like nightblood did some really crazy stuff this book um that was kind of hinted that he could do yeah uh, in some of the words of brandon and stuff wit um, has breaths uh, that he's been storing memories in because apparently you can't keep all your memories as you get older and so then we see terror vangian as odium affect that Questions yeah and that wipes too. him out yeah. The heightenings seem to be pretty important in terms of like some level of Cosmere power. Yeah. Um, and I also got to say Zahel being a return means he still has this divine breath to give, which I think will be one of the big Chekhov's guns that's going to get fired at some point in the series um, to do some, because it's basically a broken healing. It's like, you can heal anything Yeah. kind of thing. So uh, I'm curious where that will all go, but yeah, I, I'm trying to think of any other big Cosmere things. Yeah. Um, there was one that I, oh, I think the questions around, like, what does it mean when you consume Razium, the metal, uh, oh. and you burn it as, like, an Alamancer? Like, there's a lot of questions that get raised, I think, through Right, this that stuff. each god has its own metal kind of thing. Yes. Um, and you know what? Yeah. I was surprised that, like, after reading Don Shard, I thought that there would be something in this, and yet there was really just one little sequence with, with Chiri Chiri, right? Yeah, and I think it's... I'm cu I mean, there's a lot of theories about, like, Gavilar held a shard and put it in the way of kings. And, like, there's some of these kinds of things going around about maybe Unite is a sh is a, a Dawn shard that Dalinar somehow got because the voice in his head. And, like, I don't know. There's a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, God, I just had one, but I forgot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, really interesting to see how much of this stuff is converging in this book and all the different magic systems and the... The way going forward, I do think it's, it's going to be tougher ABR. and tougher for people to read this without having read some of the other stuff. Oh, there's yeah, the, the ABR. 
There's a Sion as well. Like, is there something from every? Yeah. The white plant? sand is in there. I think everything is in there. Yeah. He oh, uses that's something from office. We also learned a little bit more about the shards. We learned, I think, like four or five more shard names. Like, oh, yeah. There's four more that get revealed. I think Mercy is one of them. And Mercy sounds scary. Yeah. It sounds like from how he talked about it, like <laughs> Mercy killings. Like, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. what are we doing? So I, I, all that stuff was really interesting to me. I, I thought the, the broader Cosme reveals were all cool. Yeah, Nightblood seems to just be a bunch of like an- anti-investiture or something. I'm so curious what like Nightblood is because there's some weird stuff going on there. Well, so from what I think the the lore lore nerds have is that like Vasher went Vasher and the five scholars went to to Roshar saw Shard Blades and wanted to do the same thing with their own magic system, and so they tried to awaken metal to kill on all three realms at once. You know, yeah, which is I think what Shard or maybe they only do it. I forget. I think Shard Blades kill in all three realms, but not I only think does they Nightblade... might only kill in cognitive and physical. But they, I thought they I cut the spiritual, just... which is why your eyes burned out. Oh, maybe. Either way, okay. not only does uh, Nightblade do that, but he absorbs the investor that he's cut as well, which right. is like they're like, "Whoa, what the hell is this thing?" Um, exactly. Very good. Well, a yeah. lot to, to go on. I think by the time the next one comes out, we'll have had the next. Uh, or the final piece of Mistborn Era 2, which you haven't even read any of uh, Mistborn Era 2, I don't think, so you have to go through it. But I think there's going to be some big stuff happening in Mistborn Era 2 in the final book because it yeah. seems like there's a lot of things coming together. So Harmony wants a sword because he can't act directly. Yes, yeah, which I believe is Waxilium, uh, who somebody recently told me is a terrible and stupid name, but I, I think it's great. Um, <laughs> Anyways. So that concludes the, the video, yes? Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, we'll see you in three years <laughs> for the ne- for the next edition. <laughs> we might make a video before then of, of a different series. Yeah. I, the channel will continue to update. I've got some stuff I need to do that I've been putting off. But, I mean, the series is on yeah. hiatus for three years. The Stormlight recap and review uh, for the Travis Gafford book channel. Anyway, yeah. thanks, Mark. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye.